Now, this is the story of oceans that uh, existed in the past and don't exist today. I don't know how many we'll get, maybe almost half a dozen presentations. For example, we've talked just a little bit about the Pacific Ocean Plate, which is almost entirely um, ocean crust, which is unusual, <coughs> of course, uh, compared with Eurasia, for example, which for the most part is continent extending from essentially Japan across, the, admittedly, the uh, uh, Sea of Japan, but from China right across to Britain and, and right across to the centre of the uh, Atlantic, it's mostly a huge continental mass on that plate. But the thing about the uh, uh, continental plate is it's essentially expanding to a certain extent, uh, both uh, in the Atlantic and by material being added to Japan by these uh, uh, subduction zones that are crushing mountain ranges and adding material to the continental crust in Japan and elsewhere along the eastern side. But the uh, Pacific, we remarked, is almost half absent. Almost half the Pacific has disappeared under North America. And hence you have the very broad uh, Rocky Mountain Range system where that uh, is sink where the ocean crust of the Eastern Pacific is sliding in uh, into the Earth's mantle. Well, that sort of story has gone on around the globe oh, for at least two and a half, three billion years. We don't quite know whether it went on earlier than that, um, but uh, the concept of plate tectonics has certainly registered for, um, for you know, only three, at least three billion years. But the Tethys uh, was the, I say, the mother of all ocean systems. But there's been a series of oceans there, and uh, they're now folded mountain ranges. But where are they? Well, the mountain ranges that actually extend from the Alps um, right through Turkey, there on the left of this diagram, Pontic and Taurus Mountains, through the Caucasus and their twists and turns, through the Zagros and south of the Caspian Sea, through, of course, the Himalayas and uh, the Tian Shan, right through, in fact, right through to um, Siberia and into Southeast Asia as well, Burma and elsewhere. Those are a series of ancient oceans that have relatively recently closed, or well, there have been a sequence of oceans that have closed to form mountain ranges. And uh, most of the areas that are greenish in this diagram are uh, ancient stable blocks of continental material that probably, for the most part, more than a billion years old. The Arabian Shield, the um, Nubian Shield or Africa, uh, the Indian Shield, um, certainly Siberian and Baltic areas uh, were very, very ancient rocks. And all these browns are uh, less than a few hundred million years, essentially. Moving to the next slide. Um, as referred, often Tethys has been referred to as the goddess of the oceans. I don't think that relates to the um, actual meaning of the term Tethys in Greek, um, but um, I should have checked that. Um, but uh, there's nearly 400 million years of history for the Tethys oceans. Now that 400 million years is represented by uh, in Australia, for example, by all the material east of the South Australian Victorian border, you might say, all those rocks are 400 million years or younger, and they've been added to Australia gradually, as in fact was Zealandia, uh, until it separated about 80 million years ago and teased itself out into the um, Tasman Ocean, uh, the um, various rises like the Norfolk Rise, which uh, North Island New Zealand is part. Well, there's the Tethys Ocean, marked as a great uh, gaping jaw, you might say, in Pangaea, which was that supercontinent of 200 million years ago, uh, existed more than 200 million years as a supercontinent, and Gondwana, the southern group of continents, existed actually longer than Pangaea. It came together 500 million years ago and only separated uh, in the last uh, 80 uh, 100 million years at most. 
So uh, Gondwana was a pretty well established block and it almost was the same in an earlier phase of supercontinents too. But Pangaea has been aggregated, brought together the various blocks like when, uh, Laurentia, which is Canada, North America, Greenland, uh, the Baltic regions, all came together, um, probably uh, starting about 400 million years ago. And in fact, the Atlantic Ocean, the North Atlantic Ocean has opened three times and closed again uh, and reopened. So we'll discuss that in future talks. Tethys Ocean likewise has um, opened like a wide jaw, as you can see what uh, I refer to a jaw there with just near the word oceans of Tethys Oceans, plural. There's a little sliver of um, continental mass somewhere in the middle. Uh, um, looks a bit like a, a droplet off the tongue or something or other. And there's a lower jaw in size where Australia is sticking up and an upper jaw called Sumeria, which is a continental mass or a string of continental material that actually separated from Gondwana. It came from uh, Arabia, uh, Greater India, which is not shown there, massive India, which is missing due to its collision in the north, um, and across the Kimberley coast and the areas of uh, Arnhem Land and Papua New Guinea and so on. That's where that great sliver of uh, purple stuff called Sumeria came from, somewhere about the base of uh, animal life, about the base of the Cambrian 500 million years ago, and the Tethys Ocean opened and uh, pushed it northwards. Now, I say the Tethys Ocean because there'd been an earlier one, and there's a whole confusion of names. Of course, everybody who's written on these subjects uses a different name, and it's very hard to read up. But north of Sumeria, there'd be, say, the ancient Tethys, Paleo-Tethys, and that was a big ocean at one time. And as Tethys itself spread as an ocean, having split off from a rift valley that must have extended from sort of Turkey right through to um, Arnhem Land today, uh, that rift spread and became an ocean. And as the ocean widened, it pushed Sumeria northward uh, or carried Sumeria northward and opened the jaw, you might say, between Gondwana and the Asian section of Pangaea. Asia was still coming together. It was a whole mass of different blocks at that time. Let us read this one. Um, a large ancient Mediterranean sea was first proposed by an Austrian paleontologist in 1883. Uh, this wedge-shaped east-facing Tethys within Pangaea was described by uh, Sam Carey, a Tasmanian professor, in 1958. He plotted on a globe and realised that it had to be a very significant ocean. This was later identified as a succession of oceans separated by these north migrating terrains. That's a word geologists use, and we don't have an eye in terrains. Um, these are continental blocks uh, which have separated from the mainland, um, from a mainland, in this case Gondwana, and the separation has become an ocean. So you can imagine if uh, Tanzania separated today due to the great uh, the eastern rift valley of Africa uh, and created a new Indian Ocean, as, the, as that ocean expanded, it would actually swing um, the eastern section of Africa around and probably close much, much of the Indian Ocean. It would have to subduct under India or under Burma or somewhere like that. So in future talks, we may discuss details of Sumeria and what it has become today, but certainly we'll talk of a patch of it today in Iran because it suits me to uh, refer in detail to that part of the Tethian Ocean region. Now, these blocks were rifted off from the southern continental mass of Gondwana by the sequence of three or four spreading ridges. Now, that, or by that I mean these central oceanic ridges, which basaltic material erupts and expands, a bit like uh, is happening today in um, Iceland. These then became the 
sequence of Tethian oceans. And then finally, they've been closed by subduction both to the north and south under uh, Eurasia and even under Gondwana. And their closure has resulted in the consequent mountains of Eurasia. Now, this is a tectonic map. So in the north is the older cratons, the rocks a billion years old in orange, perhaps. By the time they get to be mauvish colours, they're about the age of our Ediacaran, first known animal fossils, somewhere around the 600 uh, million years. Uh, and I've outlined in blue uh, rocks essentially uh, younger than about uh, 350 million years. Uh, and those are the rear of Tethian oceans proper, I guess. Although um, the mauves would be probably part of the Paleotethys, that ancient ocean. But uh, even within the blues, there are a series of uh, three recognizable oceans that have closed and become mountain systems. So there's one there running through Central Asia, Tian Shan, and into the Altai Mountains and so forth. Manchuria, Siberia, off to towards uh, uh, the Sea of Okhotsk, um, east of um, Japan or northeast of Japan. And it's worthy of saying here that that area of green up in the top right is actually the North American plate. So the plate boundary comes right into Siberia and swings down essentially to include the Sea of Okhotsk. But, um, there's a triangular block which tends, tends to be cracked off there, um, which is moving like the North American plate uh, underneath Japan, but it's broken off, you might say, somewhere across uh, from the uh, head of the Aleutian Arc across towards the Siberian uh, that accurate green zone that goes north off the sheet, off the photograph, and that boundary extends up to the North Pole, of course, and across easterly of um, Greenland through Iceland as the um, boundary or northern and eastern boundary of the North American plate. Anyway, um, so essentially all this picture today, except that green area in the top right, is part of the Eurasian plate. Everything shown except a tiny little bit of Arabia tucked down there beneath the square. I've outlined an area in, with a black arrow, which is including uh, Iran, a bit of uh, Afghanistan. And that's, I'll talk more on that today. But uh, you can see the Northern section is bluish. That means the last mountain building phase was 200 to 300 million years ago. Whereas the Greens, um, are only 100 to 150 million. And where we can make out yellows, uh, such as the Kamchatka Peninsula out there in the east and Japan itself, that's really going on today uh, and no more than 20 million years old in terms of the subduction and uh, mountain building that's occurring today and volcanism, all resulting from subduction of the uh, Pacific Ocean to the west. So looking at that again, the Himalaya there, they include old rocks north of my uh, suture line. That blue line is actually including rocks of 400, um, almost no, certainly 440 million, 500 million year old rocks. But that's because they're crumbled up into the recent uh, uh, folding phenomena that's been going on in the Himalayas. Now, uh, we can see over in the 11 o'clock position right along the western border or left-hand border, the Ural Mountains. Um, they're about 350, uh, uh, come a bit younger than that, 250 million years. And there was a whole um, mountain building phase there, uh, which gave its rise, it gave rise to the term Permian. Uh, Perm is a uh, Russian, town, Russian city in the mountain system there, runs north-south into the Arctic Ocean, uh, and effectively, you might say, divides Europe and Asia. Uh, not that Mr. Putin would like to know about that, I'd guess. However, uh, moving on, 
uh, we have um, an indication in that square that I marked there. Uh, this is our um, earthquake situation in a period of, uh, what's that, uh, 30 years, roughly 34 uh, years uh, from the 1960s through to uh, 1997. And there are only the uh, more significant earthquakes. Five is about the most extreme we experience in Australia. But you can see that uh, you can't de determine a, a simple ocean closure there. You can see how the Arabian plate is tending to crack away from the African plate. And there's a plate margin outlined in uh, light red line there running up through the Zagros Mountains north of the Persian Gulf and uh, it comes down through the rift that goes through Syria and Jerusalem of course to join the Red Sea so it separates the Arabian plate but there's also a boundary going off through Cyprus and into the Mediterranean but there's this activity that's still obvious uh, in and around the Caspian Sea and the Black Sea, and they are minor plates. But, uh, but uh, in that region, between the Caspian Sea and the Persian Gulf, um, you've got a whole fold system there, a big plateau in Iran and uh, Afghanistan that uh, has these complexly folded sediments and other rocks that have been brought up part of the oceanic crust that appears amongst them at times. This is a bold mountain system when you look at it um, on Google Earth that's very contorted, like our innards, you might say, twisted and uh, uh, bent by the fold action of closing oceans. I'll mark Loristan there. I was going to try and give the uh, location details of all the photos that follow just to give you an idea of the geology of Iran, but I won't go into great detail on those. Suffice to say, there's a very prominent boundary called the main Zagros thrust, which is one of the most recent closure zones of the uh, system of oceans, Tethian oceans, just in the region of Loristan, very clearly illustrated. And looking at that boundary, it runs up through a mountain system. You can see the uh, uh, caterpillars crawling up through Loristan, uh, just north of the uh, Persian Gulf. And again, this shows some earthquakes. I won't bother to discuss them, but you get some real beauties in places. Uh, 6.7 BAM mark there. I think that's actually in the late 1990s. It's a long time ago. But the Arabian plate is essentially moving north, whereas the Eurasian plate has a south southeasterly um, movement only of a matter of a centimetre or two, whereas the Arabian plate's moving north, I think, at uh, something the order of five um, centimetres a year. I could be corrected on that. The result is a crushing of those rocks along the northern margin of the um, Persian Gulf the Zagros mountain system running all the way up into Turkey. And here's an idea of those rocks. The plateau of central Iran in the background there. This is Loristan looking easterly or northeasterly. Uh, you can see that huge sequence of limestones and things in, at the top of the diagram. They're uh, lying unconformably on some rocks in the foreground which are dipping more steeply they're dipping at about 30 degrees towards the bottom left corner if you can make out the individual beds following the uh, topography to a certain extent and dipping uh, down to the bottom left hand corner they're eroded and truncated by that huge sequence of limestones uh, up in the top section of the picture and that shows that it's been subject to great earth movement when you find unconformities of that nature. But if we look uh, even further west, just quickly, we can see uh, some of the huge belts of subduction that have uh, involved in the uh, formation of the Alps. Now, the dark blue is deeper ocean. Uh, this is about 80 million years ago. This is probably about the time 
or well, it is about the time that the um, Tasman Ocean was opening, Australia hadn't started to separate from Antarctica, uh, but uh, India was making its way uh, northward as a result of an, op an ocean opening between it and uh, uh, Antarctica, Australia, South Africa. So it was separating at this stage. Already this uh, great jaw was exercising itself, you might say, and there was subduction going on in the Straits of Gibraltar, both under Morocco and under uh, southern Spain. The Tyrrhenian Sea west of Italy was sliding in under Italy, as it does today to, uh, to a certain extent, and accounts for Vesuvius and uh, a twist and turn at the bottom end accounts for Mount Etna and other volcanic activity, subduction that's going on today. But that there's a great curve of subduction of ocean uh, that formed the Carpathians in the northeast and the Alps to the north of um, Italy there. Uh, so that plate of Italy is being pushed northwards, you might say, with, the, with ocean disappearing beneath it, somewhere around the Po Plain and, uh, and various parts of the Swiss Alps. The crestal regions of the um, Swiss Alps are actually, origin they originated way down on the continental shelf of Africa. And that platelet has been pushed further north like an impacted molar, you might say. Uh, Turkey, you can see, is rather displaced at that time. It had ultimately um, an ocean closed, the Paratethys, there's another name, which for a northern branch of the Tethys Ocean in the region of um, the Alps. Shallow water, mostly lighter blue, but the subduction was going on southward under Turkey and under Iran, whereas um, a southern branch was closing due to subduction northward, uh, as indicated by those red lines that the Tethys Ocean marked north of Arabia. So the whole process was going on in Europe, and that'll be subject of many discussions later in the story. But you notice there, there are two branches of Tethys Oceans with different names again. And if we look at some of the complications in that region, there were a whole group of uh, blocks that were relatively stable uh, as time progressed to about 20 million years ago, um, when of course India was already collided, had already collided with um, Asia at this time. And uh, the only remnants of, uh, the, of two or more Tethian oceans were just shallow regions around these more stable blocks marked in the center there as the Loot Block or the Surgeon Zone, uh, Central Afghanistan, Helmut and Caucasus, et cetera, were rising out of the sea. And Turkey as the Anatolian platform. So that region was crushing as the jaw was closing by Africa um, moving and India likewise. I think that probably uh, gives an outline of how complex um, this crushing of an ocean uh, can be in that more stable blocks probably rise as mountains and the sediments around them get crushed. So the uh, new Tethys or Neo Tethys is gradually closed along with the older versions. Oh, that's Iran with a few of the locations where photos are, are going to be shown. I won't go into enormous detail with those, but uh, suffice to say, um, in the regions around Tehran, uh, the rocks are nearly vertical, they're sedimentary rocks. So every layer is standing vertical and you have to make uh, quite a complex examination to work out which way those rocks are facing. In other words, which way was up? Is it getting younger as you go away from the foreground or is it getting younger towards you? Rocks in this sort of situation can be overturned, but there are all sorts of features in the sediment which uh, can tell us which way was up and which are the top of the beds as distinct from eroded bases quite often. Uh, it's characteristic if you can find a scouring or something, then clearly that has to be the younger unit scouring the older one and gives rise to what's called a disconformity. 
Many of the rocks are complexly folded. This depends to a certain extent on the extreme pressures that they're subjected to and also their stability as rocks. If they're uh, slippery, slidey muds, then they'll tend to distort in the way that we see here. Often they're folded into simple anticlines. But again, you do have to check that this is just a simple anticline and that the facing of the rocks is upwards because in the Flinders Ranges even, and we can um, identify rocks that look just like that, but in fact, they're facing downwards. And it isn't an anticline as such. It's what we'd call an antiform. Uh, it looks like an anticline, but in detail, it could be inverted. But this is a, almost a natural cross section. Of course, slope would take into account a bit of variation, but it's slightly asymmetric in that you've only got a 20 degree dip on one side and a 40 degree dip of the strata on the other side. And of course, that's what geologists do. They go into the field and measure the uh, dip angles, check out where they can find the axis of a fold and those are features which they map on a geological map. And ultimately, uh, it helps to determine the sequence of strata and the history of the um, geology. These are about 100 million years old um, up there in the um, um, main uh, Zagros mountain belt. Now here's a fold viewed, viewed from satellite imagery in that region. And you see how I've marked in a synclinal fold axis. That's the opposite, of course, to the anticline. This is a bathtub, as it were. Uh, we don't see the far end of the bathtub, but uh, uh, because of the shape of the outcrop and the dip of the strata. And if we look carefully, we can see there's some indications um, on the southern side in particular that, there, that the strata are dipping northward and uh, I'm estimating at about 30 degrees, whereas on the northern side of that synclinal fold axis, they're dipping in at about uh, 30 degrees to the south. I can tell that from uh, the outcrop patterns. Um, if, uh, if it were the other way around, then of course it would be an anticline. If they were dipping away from the fold axis, it wouldn't be um, a bathtub, but it'd be a dome-like feature and uh, we'd call it an anticline. But the reason it's got that um, hook shape like a bath is that, that it, exactly it is a bath. You might say one stratum would be dipping down and forming the end of the bath just under that uh, top dip symbol, it would be, uh, if you followed a bed, it'd form a shallow bathtub as you went uh, to the uh, left-hand side of the picture. And if you drill down, uh, you'd ultimately get this boldly outcropping unit that forms the um, very dendritic drainage above the dip symbols, or below the southern one, um, and that would get might occur at three kilometers depth or something like that in that syncline because it's a basin like structure. Oh, back to the earthquake situation. Oh, that was uh, out further in the um, near the biggest star at three o'clock, that previous photo, but um, uh, they're earthquake epicenters, so they're very active epicenters. Now, we say there's a history of closed oceans. Um, I don't know that this is going to mean a lot to us. Um, I think perhaps I'll gloss over this. Caspian areas were separated by ocean until about 200 million years ago. Uh, and there's a lot of older rocks uh, up around the Caspian Sea. Um, and that was related to the closure of early oceans of 350 million years ago. Um, but the North Iran suture uh, was a plate boundary somewhere around 250 million years ago, when ironically, the Iran plate was part of Gondwana and you were separating off uh, Sumeria and other blocks, which uh, migrated a long way north before being oceans being closed and bringing them back, you might say, to the uh, equatorial regions. Now, oceanic crustal rocks, 
they're called ophiolites. And that's a term we'll use from time to time. It's a complicated name, ophiolite. Uh, and they occur through many mountain belts. They're a characteristic type sequence of rocks, really. And they represent ancient oceans. You can recognize from, if you say, oh, that's an ophiolite sequence, then you can say, gosh, an ocean closed here. And uh, in the Zagros, for example, 150 million years ago, you can check the closure of uh, Tethys Ocean. Um, and many of these ophiolites also surround those relatively stable blocks in central and east Iran. Uh, and that's because they, they stood firm while oceans slipped underneath them. Sometimes the ocean crustal rocks flapped up on top and that left ophiolites included in the mountain system. And we'd say, oh yes, here's obvious uh, closure of an ocean here because part of it didn't disappear. It actually um, came up and uh, is preserved on top of the uh, uh, continental rocks. Um, so anyway, the Zagros Mountains represent the platform and shelf to the Arabian Craton. So those rocks were quietly depositing, much like Eastern Australia is today, uh, except that um, it suffered the uh, fate of having Zealandia crush back against us and uh, include uh, ocean floor sliding up in places. So that may yet happen in Australia. We don't know the future. But uh, where I put mid PZ, PZ is missing, means rocks are about uh, 400, 300 million years are just not present in that region. Uh, they're mostly younger, they're mostly 100 million years or so, um, and or 150 million years crushed into that mountain range. But you do get much younger uh, indications of um, oceans closing, these ophiolites. And the classic example for the world is in Oman, where about 90 million years ago, um, the, uh, you might say, the uh, Sea of Oman or the uh, eastern areas of the Persian Gulf um, crushed together and ocean floor was pushed up over the Arabian uh, block. And I'll skip over that, or we will see some photos, I think, from Khorasan up in the north. No, we don't. That one's again in the uh, Zagros Mountains. Um, and they're characteristic of um, peculiar structures, which, of which we have nearly 100 in the Flinders Ranges, and that is salt domes ancient salt, which has been at the bottom of the continental shelf sediments, probably eight or 10 kilometers down in the passive margin continental shelf sediments. Um, and as the mountain building started, the salt was, um, um, it migrated under gravity because it's so light. And from a salt bed that might've been a kilometer thick covering hundreds and hundreds of kilometers in length, um, popped up all over the place like um, intrusions that occur in a lava lamp where you see an, a light oil bubble rising from the warmth um, in a lava lamp. This is exactly how these um, bodies of salt rise up. And that's what they look like in, in relief on Google Earth. Um, they form anticlines and they punch up as, well, they're dark areas on these maps. But if you look at 12 o'clock, there's a circular one pushing up through the um, axis of an anticline. And that's a simple salt dome forming an anticline around itself. But uh, the southern two are actually unique systems where the salt has come up and is, is forming glaciers in the present day. It's actually exuding like toothpaste from a tube and running out over the uh, plains, and of course it's a very arid region, apart from periodic downpour pours, but um, it spreads out like glaciers of salt. And this is characteristic of um, the Zagros mountain system. So you'd be looking perhaps across uh, 50 kilometers of uh, 
from the foreground to the background. The individual ridges might be, uh, or oh, they might be 15 kilometres wide, and those salt glaciers would be uh, 10 kilometres or so. So, well, example, we have a thing very like that one at 12 o'clock in the centre of the Flinders Ranges, and it is 12 kilometres across. That's the Blinman Dome, uh, Blinman Salt Dome. So the town of Blinman would be right on the eastern side of the circular or semicircular body, which is 12 kilometres wide. It's big. And uh, that's intruded up through thousands of metres of sediment. But it all happened 600, 500 million years ago in, in the Flinders Ranges. So if we're looking at the geological framework of Iran, there's that, there is a broad area of a central plateau, plateau, which has got salt lake depressions and great sandy desert there, but it's surrounded by, well, I'd say several triangles of mountain ranges, the Alberts along the Caspian, the Zagros along the Persian Gulf, et cetera, Makran range north of Oman, extending into Baluchistan and uh, Afghanistan in the southeast. The Zagros has had a folding, well, it's going on today, it's certainly the last 10 million years. It does have more ancient remnants in the central regions. I won't go into this Paleotethys and Eurasian fragments, but, but yeah, well, there are bits and pieces of the ancient oceans and uh, more stable blocks that are more than uh, 300 million years old. Always worthy of remembering Zagros Mountains are great um, oil producers. Salt domes are very prominent producers of oil because they form the anticlines. And 60% of the world oil passes through that Strait of Hormoz in the region of Oman, the tip of which is Oman and the other side, of course, Iran. And that's where we have a bit of problem, of course, with blockading if Iran wishes to stop oil coming out to the rest of the world. And that's the zone there. Hormuz is an island, which is a salt dome actually, sitting offshore from Iran. Some of these areas of the Zagros show extraordinary uplift, and that's the uh, island uh, of uh, Hormuz Gar. Uh, as I say, there's a salt dome associated with that uplift. It's really extraordinary and um, rapid too which gives rise to those canyons. And uh, more of that same scenery, extraordinary uh, recent uplift and erosion. Looking again at some of those rock types, so deformed, uh, vertically standing here. If you look behind that truck, you can see a layer about uh, or five metres behind it. If you run your eye up uh, above the white unit, uh, there's a one with a whole lot of broken debris uh, blocks that are um, several meters in size and clearly um, it was a very active erosion at the time these sediments were deposited part of a sequence that's eight or ten kilometers thick of these strata again there's another one with a whole lot of debris um, in front of the vehicle about 10 meters above that uh, reddish band. And that's the region in which uh, this occurs. It's adjacent to one of the um, more stable blocks being pushed up to near vertical and situation. More of that uh, zone where you have uh, the rocks of the central plateau, almost flat lying in the background forming mountains, and then a very distinct unconformity running across east-west where the older rocks are folded and dipping at about 40 degrees or so to the right, and they've been eroded off, and then the new sequence of strata has formed across that um, uh, ridge line and gradually accumulated, which included an enormous uh, array of limestones. More attractive uh, uh, hogbacks of uh, strata dipping slightly you know, dipping at a steep angle towards us, probably 60 degrees or so. And uh, others again in east of Azerbaijan in the um, region of the Caspian. 
And when we look at uh, more general geological maps, um, they've outlined the uh, geological survey of Iran have outlined the belts that include ophiolites, therefore have remnants of oceanic crust in them. You see a purple zone, I'm not sure about the browns, I suppose the Zagros belt does in places, but uh, certainly that uh, um, purple or um, bright pink colored Orumia uh, uh, zone uh, includes ophiolite, that is uh, oceanic crust, uh, that East Iran built in pale blue does also, as does the zone of black things east of the Caspian Sea. So oceans have closed in there. Um, and in the south, the green Macran zone is closing today. It's a classic area of subduction north and east of uh, Oman. So again, what is ophiolites? A rock assemblage, it's recognizable as oceanic crust which is out of place and appearing on the continents because we rarely see oceanic crust in the ocean, obviously. Um, possible example of um, uh, some of the islands on the mid uh, oceanic ridges. Um, but the ancient ocean crust that has not been subducted, but rather obducted, that means lifted up rather than pushed down, and they're obducted onto the continent during plate collisions. Um, it has uh, the assemblage has deep ocean sediments. They're very characteristic because they don't see much material from continent. They're a lot of iron rich or silica rich material that's just accumulated slowly in the deep sea, including manganese nodules and little meteoric fragments of iron oxide that become essentially out of the sky over millions of years or hundreds of hundreds and hundreds of thousands of years, but they're characterized by the basaltic rocks that are uh, developed at the mid-ocean ridge. And uh, they often include several kilometers of the mantle rock, which is a very heavy iron, uh, magnesium rich rock, uh, dark colored. And you've got uh, very good examples in Oman, as I mentioned before. But the North Island of New Zealand, north of Auckland, is also uh, ocean floor that was pushed up, I think, uh, something of the order of 19 million years ago. Same with the Huon Peninsula of Papua New Guinea, the northern section of, uh, north of, right on the northern boundary of New Guinea. Uh, and uh, that uh, is almost in process today. It's very young, that abduction. West Newfoundland has uh, obduction of oceanic crust, which dates back mm, near 500 million years, certainly 450 million years. So in various parts of the world, they're good illustrations of uh, oceanic crustal rocks that have been pushed into the mountain systems. The, the uh, characteristic um, ocean floor sediment material is often very banded like this with silica and iron rich layers. Don't know that that's well explained as to why it is so. And we see these in Australia, we see 500 million year old ones actually in Victoria, which are pretty clearly deep oceanic cherts um, with hematite beds in between. And there's a great deal of uh, uh, basalt extruded um, onto that same sedimentary sea floor but they form these peculiar pillows because they're quenched by the deep ocean cool, of course, and quenches the basalt as it erupts. So do you see these pillow forms, with a pencil there on it, not large often, uh, quite, you know, they may get up to pillow size or the size of a small car, but the fringes of them are often quenched and glassy. In that case, two or three centimeters of the outside edge has been quenched by the ocean before a little bit of liquid has escaped somewhere else, been quenched very rapidly and formed a similar uh, body. As we get to the bottom of these uh, masses of uh, ophiolite, you can actually make a division between crustal rocks and the ancient mantle of the earth. This would be a, 
uh, intrusive contact, really. The rocks are, are uh, igneous rocks. They're crystallized from melts, but there's a distinct difference between the olivine rich moho mantle and the crustal gabbroic rocks, which are more like basalt in composition. Anyway, this is very characteristic in the uh, uh, in Oman, you see these features, and uh, oh, I've just about hidden Oman there uh, uh, under the word 150 million year is probably where you start to see that uh, obducted belt in Oman. But there are the uh, similar rocks in the Zagros Mountains, um, 150 million years old in that case, rather than uh, 90 or, uh, or significantly less in Oman. And these, of course, result from different ages of orogenesis or mountain building, uh, resulting from the crushing together of the plates. Here's the situation in the uh, plates uh, as they exist today, with subduction going along the uh, Persian Gulf. The word convergence indicates uh, the Persian Gulf sliding in, essentially, under the Zagros mountain system. And uh, further north, uh, running through northern Iran or the southern Caspian region, um, you have another subduction belt uh, indicated by those uh, black triangles. Uh, this is going back to uh, Oman, grandson Harry uh, striding through the, the uh, uh, limestone sequence, about 100 million year old limestones which were formed on the northern coast of, of Arabia, really, as um, quiet uh, limestone reefs and so forth, uh, 100, 120 million years ago. But they've all been overthrust. And in the far distance on the mountains, you have the oceanic crust being pushed, pushed over much more recently, probably even in the last 20 million years in that case. So these are huge blocks of... Um, continental margin sediments of a thrust plate, admittedly not still quite in place. They've been thrust northward from the Arabian margin, but the Ophiolite has come in the opposite direction, southward from the center of the uh, Oman, Sea of Oman, or the uh, Persian Gulf, essentially, and pushed up over those limestones. And that gives you an idea. That's a uh, uh, view uh, northwesterly across the uh, huge mass of oceanic crust bent in a great arch and um, the uh, folded rocks of a hundred million year age are uh, uh, shown there with a scale of a hundred meters shown in red near the, near the six clock position and you can see the folded limestones in this anticline in the foreground but um, in the lower country and in the black ridges um, at nine o'clock, 10, 11 o'clock, is the ophiolite rock that's been thrust right across the top of it and is now deeply eroded. So uh, this is Oman and why it's such a feature for examination of the uh, very ancient um, oceanic crustal rocks. It's uh, quite an outstanding region to visit. And here's Harry amongst some of those rocks. Um, many of them are altered to uh, a soapstone because of the intense pressures and things that they've undergone. And he's walking on a soapstone or serpentinite there, um, snake-like serpentinite, and uh, uh, it erodes very easily, but produces a lot of magnesium um, carbonate, which are the white masses, as partially uh, weathering product. Again, just some of these uh, separate blocks, they're like loose teeth in the crunching jaw of Africa against Eurasia. The Luke block and Afghanistan, Iran have all done a bit of a rotation, I suppose, more like um, uh, foodstuffs being chewed in the great moor of the Tethian Oceans. Uh, the blue ridges are the uh, uh, center oceanic ridges of today, Red Sea opening the uh, Owen Fracture Zone, which is, uh, defines the western border of the Indian Plate as it's sliding northwards uh, and crushing into the Himalayas and the uh, uh, 
great knot sewn, the Parmian knot um, between the Eurasian plate and India. This is the last slide, I'll go back uh, to the um, tectonic map, which shows the ages at which the folding occurs. And you can see we've been dealing a lot with 150, 100 million year ages uh, in that sector down near uh, Iran uh, and Afghanistan. But the yellows creep in north of the uh, Sea of Oman, Baluchistan, uh, etc., and running through the Zagros Mountains. And they're only 20 million years or so. And that accounts for um, part of the uh, obducted crust in Oman. And that southernmost section of blue line occurs about uh, eight o'clock. Um, accounts for that being only about 19 million years at its youngest. So you can get a picture there, um, relatively younger closure of um, oceanic areas up in Siberia and across uh, China and um, right through China, in fact, till you get into the Stans and uh, particularly Afghanistan and Iran. Whereas the older belt of um, mountain systems, the older Tethian oceans appear in blue to the north. I think we'll leave it there and any questions you have, we'll run to now. <laughs>